So thank you for joining us for a discussion today on Perpetua Resources and an update on gold market fundamentals. I'm Mackenzie Lyon, Vice President of Public Affairs for Perpetua. Today we have with us Laurel Sayer, President and CEO, Jessica Largent, Vice President of Investor Relations and Finance from Perpetua Resources, and Philip Clapwhite, who is the Managing Director of Precious Metals Insight Limited. We will have a question answer session at the end of this presentation. And as we go through today's presentation, please note that you can use the QA button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for today's panelists. And first, we will hear from Laurel. Thanks, Mackenzie. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Before we jump in, I'll quickly point out our disclaimers on slide two. For those unfamiliar with Perpetua Resources, we are an Idaho-based company and our project is located in the remote central mountains of Idaho. Our investment thesis has never been stronger. First and foremost, we plan to redevelop one of the largest, lowest cost and long life gold projects in the US. Given our low cost, the Stibnite Gold Project has great economics with a 15 year reserve life and a payback period of less than three years. And we have a valuable byproduct in antimony, which is a critical mineral, and Perpetua can reestablish primary production in the U.S. and play a key role in the clean energy value chain. Our project is located in one of the best mining jurisdictions in the world, and we have strong community support. The strong support we have in Idaho has been built over the last decade as our communities and politicians have seen our commitment to responsible mining and restoration at Stibnite. We are well positioned to deliver environmental solutions and create value for all of our stakeholders. One of the many reasons we are so unique is because we will take an area abandoned after 100 years of mining activity, most of which was to support World War II and the Korean War, and use a sustainable approach to restore the environment and develop a modern mining project with critical mineral production. We get to solve environmental issues through the funding and development of our world-class asset. Perpetua Resources Restoration and Mitigation Plans provide early action on water quality and legacy feature cleanup as well as concurrent restoration and reclamation for any new disturbances. Today, over 10.5 million tons of unlined legacy tailings and waste rock degrade water quality, and the East Fork of the South Fork of the Salmon River flows into an abandoned mining pit, which blocks fish migration to over 30 miles of habitat. The project will ultimately improve water quality it will restore fish passage that has been blocked for decades and clean up legacy tailings and waste sites. I personally have been a lifelong advocate for conservation and my passion is in environmental restoration. I believe strongly that industry and the environment can and must work together to restore this site. Now I'll touch on our strategic and valuable byproduct, antimony. Antimony has been identified as one of the 35 critical minerals given the U.S. has no primary production, and China, Russia, and Tajikistan dominate the world supply with more than 90% of global production. The U.S. Department of Interior have defined critical minerals as those essential to economic and national security, which are vulnerable to supply chain disruptions. Earlier this year, Canada published their critical mineral list and antimony was included, following in the footsteps of Europe, Australia, and the US. Historically, antimony was used for its properties of strengthening alloys and making them resistant to corrosion and as a flame retardant. Currently, antimony is being used in bearings for wind and hydro turbines and tinting for solar panels, cell phones, semiconductors, plastics, and cable sheathing. And most notably, it is also used in a low cost liquid metal battery. Looking forward, our antimony will be used to help power the liquid metal battery on a commercial scale, 
and fundamentally change the way power grids operate. The current administration has made it clear that securing America's critical mineral supply chain is essential to our national and economic security. And we couldn't agree more, and we are ready to be part of the solution. In fact, our project alone could supply more than 35% of annual U.S. demand over our first six years of production. Perpetua is proud to help reestablish domestic antimony production to protect America's energy and defense future. We are excited and proud to have recently signed a strategic agreement to supply a portion of our antimony production to support the commercialization of Ambry's liquid metal battery. Our agreement establishes the foundation to help facilitate the decarbonization of energy grids in the U.S. and around the world. Ambry has developed an antimony-based low-cost battery for long-duration, daily cycling energy storage market. Their batteries are both efficient and they are safe. Our project will provide Ambry with antimony from the only responsible and domestically mined source of the critical mineral in the U.S. Our current minimum supply commitment can power over 30 gigawatt hours of energy storage. And to put that into perspective, that is more than eight times the total additions to the U.S. energy storage market last year and could power approximately 1 million U.S. homes with solar power for the 20-year battery life lifespan. The partnership, this partnership underscores the role modern mining can play in solving the world's climate change challenges. And it directly links the restoration and the responsible redevelopment of our project to achieving our nation's energy goals. Now turning now to our project's highlights in the next couple of slides. The Stibnite project is one of the largest independent gold reserves in the United States with 4.8 million ounces, and it is the seventh largest reserve out of all U.S. gold deposits. In total, we have 6 million ounces of measured and indicated resources, and an additional 1.2 million ounces of inferred resources. This slide does not include our significant antimony endowment, which has reserves of 148 million pounds and 206 million pounds in measured and indicated resources. Our annual gold production will average approximately 300 ounces per year over the mine life and more than 460,000 ounces per year in the first four years, which would make it the largest producing mine in the U.S. outside the Nevada Gold Mines Joint Venture. The Stibnite project will be powered by the lowest carbon emissions grid in the nation. Our ability to source low-cost Idaho hydropower combined with a low strip ratio and an antimony byproduct credit of $70 per ounce, we are well positioned in the lowest quartile of the global cost curve. Life of mine, all in sustaining costs, will average less than $650 per ounce, and in the first four years, it will be less than $450 per ounce. All of these factors will allow the mine to generate strong free cash flows, averaging $584 million for the first four years of operation and $300 million per year over the 15 year life. And with that, I will hand it over to Philip to provide an overview of the gold market. Thank you very much. Uh, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to share with you uh, an outlook for the gold price over the next few years. Um, I've entitled my presentation, Inflation, Interest Rates, Debt, and the Dollar, Why the Longer Run Outlook for Gold Prices Remains Very Bullish. Um, we got some Q&A at the end of this uh, webinar, so um, you'll have some opportunities to ask me about supply demand questions if you wish, or just ask me about this presentation. Uh, but um, we'll look at these four reasons why I think gold remains very much in a bull market in the medium to long term. Can we have the next slide, please? 
So if we look at these four reasons that I've cited here, uh, start with inflation. Uh, the first thing to note is that I fundamentally disagree with the Fed that inflation is transitory. Uh, indeed, I think a long-term shift has started from a disinflationary to an inflationary environment. And that's being driven by a number of factors. Uh, it includes demographics, changes in the composition of the labor force, uh, a reversal in global trade growth, um, inequality, which is going to have to be sorted out one way or another, uh, probably inflationary wise. That leads us to the fact that government fiscal deficits are not going to go away and indeed probably uh, will grow again. Uh, and that will lead to faster money supply growth, uh, higher inflation, and eventually, most importantly, changing inflation expectations, which so far, as we'll see, have been reasonably well anchored for the medium to long term by the Fed's uh, messaging. As regards interest rates, well, uh, we've heard a lot about uh, potential tightening of monetary policy of late uh, following the FOMC meeting, but I don't think the Fed really will tighten monetary policy. Uh, namely, it's not going to reduce the size of its balance sheet and return to a positive real short term interest rate, which I would define as real tightening. Uh, they'll go from ultra loose to just very loose, essentially. And I also think that tightening cycle, if we can call it that, will be short and very quickly reversed because it will have very adverse effects on bond stock and housing markets and ultimately the real economy. So I think the Fed funds rate will return to the uh, upper bound of 25 basis points a lot more quickly, actually, than it did in 2018, 2019. Uh, I think we're going to see in the next couple of years a probable financial crisis and economic downturn, which means that the central bank will actually have to embark on further QE and large scale monetization of government fiscal deficits. And that's, of course, going to push up the debt. Uh, we've seen already a massive rise in debt levels over 2021 uh, due to the pandemic, and this is creating huge vulnerability to higher interest rates and an increase in spreads, be those credit spreads or inflation spreads. So this, again, is another reason, of course, why the Fed simply isn't able to increase uh, interest rates and tighten monetary policy aggressively in the face, potentially, and I think actually in future, of uh, continual increases in inflation. Not only that, but if we look at the sort of political alignment here, um, government debtors, and in fact, I believe the general public will all favor financial repression, namely uh, caps on interest rates and market forces being effectively um, put under control by uh, the, the Fed's uh, actions in the market through the purchasing of assets and the control of interest rates. Because really, the, the alternative to this is um, to financial repression and inflation, which effectively inflates away the debt, is austerity, financial crises, and a very severe recession to bring down demand. And no one really wants that. Maybe creditors do, but they'll be in a minority. This is going to have, of course, in turn, a pretty negative effect on the US dollar. Uh, I think the US dollar is going to depreciate pretty substantially over the next few years. The US dollar is already severely overvalued on a purchasing power parity basis. And if we see higher US inflation than in Japan and the Eurozone, it'll only make that situation worse. And indeed, I think that's exactly what we will see. So these US trade and current account deficits and the related deterioration in the US's net international investment position, i.e. the difference between its external financial assets and its external financial liabilities, that, that's just going to get worse unless we have a major currency adjustment. Um, again, the only alternative to that feasibly is a massive reduction in US demand through a recession. Um, clearly, the path of least resistance and the most politically acceptable path will be a major currency adjustment, as I've suggested here. Besides this, I think the dollar is going to be undermined by the fact that we are shifting, already shifting uh, slowly, but uh, surely to a multipolar financial system away from essentially a system where the do dollar is the global hegemon. 
So with that, let's get on to some of the details. Um, first of all, looking at inflation in the next slide, please. So if we look at inflation expectations, you can see uh, the black line on this chart um, measures through the University of Michigan survey expected price changes in the next 12 months on the CPI. And you can see that those expectations of inflation in the short run have essentially risen to match the going rate more or less of inflation. So, so this essentially shows you that yes, consumers are aware that inflation is much higher and they expect inflation in the next 12 months is gonna to continue to be, shall we say, problematic. But if you look at the situation on a five-year basis, basis the five-year, five-year forward inflation expectation rate, you can see that whilst inflation expectations have definitely risen, they're still pretty much under control at just above 2%. So again, I'd reiterate that the Fed so far has been pretty effective with its messaging that inflation is transitory. But I think there's going to be a tremendous wake up call at some point when the general public, the markets realize that this ain't so. Uh, shall we get to the next slide, please? Now, one of the prime reasons, of course, why I think that this inflation is not temporary or transitory is that the growth in money supply is really still going at quite a rate of knots. Uh, you can see here what's happened to money supply growth, the red line. Uh, this is a stock of money, by the way, from 2007 through to, I think this, the last print here is uh, second quarter of 2021. Um, you can see the pandemic has led to a significant increase in the rate of growth of money. But very importantly, what we've seen is that whilst initially the velocity uh, of circulation of this money collapsed as people were basically locked up, not spending money. Uh, subsequently, that velocity of money has essentially uh, flatlined and coupled with a further tremendous increase in money stock. That means that the effective money supply uh, is increasing very quickly indeed. And that is driving ultimately uh, much higher inflation in the United States. And I would expect that this picture will continue, that we'll continue to see rapid growth in the money stock, maybe not quite as rapid in the next year or so as we've seen uh, in the last year and a half, but still I think M2 will grow quickly. And I think M2 velocity may even pick up a bit if the public start to doubt the Fed's message that inflation is transitory. Uh, that will provide people with an incentive to spend money rather than uh, hoard money, which will be a uh, value of which will be eaten away by inflation. Uh, next slide, please. So before we leave the money stock argument, um, you can still see that growth in money supply was still growing at about 13% year on year in early September. It's come down from its heights, but we're well into di double digit territory in terms of growth in money supply. And I think that, of course, is the sort of underpinning for the inflation that we will see in future and why inflation will not actually come down all that much uh, in spite of the Fed's um, messaging. Uh, next slide, please. One of the prime reasons for thinking this is the question of demographics and what's happening in terms of the composition of the labor force or the potential size of the labor force uh, in the next uh, decade or two. And essentially there's been some very interesting research produced by Goodhart and Pradhan in their book, The Great Demographic Reversal, from which I've taken two slides here. I won't go into too much detail other than to make the point that they argue very strongly and I think quite convincingly that one of the reasons why we had such low inflation uh, in the 90s and 2000s was the integration of China and Eastern Europe and its huge workforce into the global market uh, and into the global trading system and that we are going to see a certain unwinding of that in future as labor forces actually shrink uh, and as world trade uh, possibly shrinks, but certainly doesn't grow the way it did in the 90s and 2000s. And that's going to have quite a big uh, effect, shall we say, uh, on prices, particularly of goods, uh, in addition because of other factors not mentioned here, such as reshoring uh, and deglobalization. Uh, next slide, please. 
if we look at the sort of inflation pressures in the pipeline, I think it's also worth bearing in mind uh, what's happening in terms of commodity prices and wholesale price inflation. Uh, if we look at the PPI, producer price inflation rate in the US, this was at 20% year on year in August, which suggests that inflationary pressures coming down the pike remain pretty considerable. Uh, next slide, please. I mentioned uh, a few moments ago that I really doubt that the Fed will actually tighten monetary policy. In other words, reduce the size uh, of its balance sheet and raise meaningfully uh, interest rates. Um, I think looking at this picture of the Fed's balance sheet since before the global financial crisis up until a couple of months ago, you could see that what we're seeing is essentially a continued increase, of course, because of these 120 billion a month asset purchases by the Fed in the size of its balance sheet. Now, tapering is, is going to slow those purchases, but not reverse them. Uh, and I think a reduction in the balance sheet is most unlikely. Uh, and indeed, we're going to see further growth in the Fed's balance sheet once more QE is deemed necessary to counter what I think is inevitably uh, major financial stresses and an economic slowdown in the US. Next slide, please. Any Fed rate increases, which I think will probably take place over 2022, uh, will be less pronounced and even more rapidly reversed than they were last time round. You can see here a graph of the Fed funds rate. This is the effective Fed run funds rate in blue uh, back from 1965 to, um, I think, a month ago. And the real Fed funds interest rate uh, using PCE inflation uh, to deflate the Fed funds rate to see what real interest rates basis the Fed funds rate uh, look like. And you could see that um, the tightening that, that took place from 2015 to 2018 was really pretty modest compared to uh, the sort of episodes of tightening that we've seen in the past. And that most importantly, real interest rates barely got into positive territory before they plummeted again uh, and have fallen further due to this pickup inflation in inflation uh, that we've been discussing. Now, I think we're not going to see any chance whatsoever that US policy rates are going to become positive in real terms uh, in the next so-called tightening cycle. Um, I, I actually very much doubt that we get beyond 150 basis points uh, on the upper bound uh, at best on the next tightening cycle compared to the 250 basis points the Fed managed to just about do last time round. Um, next slide, please. One of the reasons why, of course, the Fed's hands are effectively tied is what will be the reaction of asset markets to any serious attempt to tighten monetary policy. And one of the biggest markets, of course, that, that is exceptionally vulnerable to any uh, thought of higher interest rates is the US stock market. And I've charted here as an indication of the extent to which the US stock market is uh, in bubble territory, is seriously overvalued and therefore very vulnerable to any increase in monetary uh, in interest rates and tightening of monetary policy, is its ratio, the ratio of the Wilshire 5000 here to US nominal GDP. And you can see that this is actually beyond where it was at the height of the dot-com bubble and is in uncharted territory. So you can imagine that here is a market where much of the, shall we say, excuse, as I would call it, for why stocks have gone to such tremendous heights is the fact that uh, yields have been so low and therefore stocks by comparison are, are really the only game in town because the bond market is on the floor uh, and is tremendously overvalued and therefore given treasuries um, 140 basis points or 25 basis points of the Fed funds rate, these sort of valuations maybe, maybe are not so crazy. But once we get to a world where there's a real prospect of much higher interest rates, and I would say even prospect, let alone reality uh, of that happening, uh, I think this could start to look very nasty indeed. Uh, next slide, please. And if the stock market's in a bubble, well, so is the bond market. Um, 
we I just discussed um, a moment ago that the the treasury market, but even more extreme, arguably, is what's happening in in the corporate bond market. And here I'm looking at triple B U.S. corporate bonds, uh, an index provided by CB Bank of America. And you can see on the far right of the chart here that that these are extremely low level uh, of interest rates that are being demanded for triple B debt, uh, corporate debt in the United States. Uh, unprecedented again, uh, compared to what has preceded it. Uh, and this is a very low interest rate with spreads which are really extremely uh, reduced over treasuries uh, and with pretty small inflation premium also in, in, in those yields. So this again is, is uh, an accident waiting to happen if there is more than a hint of monetary tightening in the US. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, if we're looking at a third bubble that I think potentially the Fed could pop uh, if, if, it, if it isn't very careful is the housing market, which um, has been blown up tremendously by these ultra low interest rates and uh, more latterly uh, the, the growth in money supply uh, that we saw earlier. Uh, next slide, please. What's, of course, been happening um, since the global financial crisis and then uh, even more spectacularly since the pandemic struck is an increase in debt. Um, here we see US domestic debt. Uh, this is total US domestic non-financial debt. Uh, it's ratio to nominal GDP. And this measures uh, all uh, non-financial debt for both the public and the private sector, both households and corporates. Uh, and you can see that that has spiked tremendously, that that's come down a bit as nominal GDP has increased uh, after the biggest hit uh, uh, took place in the pandemic. We saw that sort of huge rise in GDP, which obviously has, has um, increased the device or and brought down uh, this ratio a bit, but it's still at a quite extraordinary level and in, in my view, uh, is set to increase again uh, as soon as we run into difficulties, be that uh, bubbles popping, be that uh, the economy running into trouble and the Fed uh, and the government having to uh, essentially uh, enact further QE and monetization of fiscal deficits to, to try and bail out the system, uh, companies, households and corporates uh, from uh, you know, the next round of crisis. Of course, what, sorry, before we get to that side, what this picture also means most importantly is again, the point I was making at the beginning of this presentation is, well, how do you actually get out of this hole? Um, I just mentioned how they're probably gonna to add to debt, but to actually bring the debt down, the only real effective way to do it is to match what happened in the 1940s and also to a large extent in the 1970s, and that is to inflate away the debt. It's by far and away the path of least resistance because the alternative is really pretty horrific when you have debts at these levels to GDP in terms of the adjustment that would have to take place and the degree of austerity and collapse in demand that would need to take place to bring these numbers back into line. Uh, inflation is by far and away the easiest, more comfortable and less painful way to do this. And next slide, please. Um, the US government, of course, uh, particularly the federal government has been the major source of an increase in these debts. If we look at the um, rise in debt levels in the US of this non-financial debt since the fourth quarter of, end of the fourth quarter of 2019 through to the first quarter of 2021, you can see of that 7.7 .7 trillion increase uh, five trillion of it has come from the federal government. Um, now, we, we, we may or may not see uh, expenditure measures enacted by the current administration in, in, in the near term, given the uh, opposition um, in Congress to, to, to some of those policies and to some of that spending. But I think the, the medium to long term picture, and this is whether it's Democrat or, or, or Republican, is going to be that at the first sign of trouble, uh, the print printing presses will be revved up and deficits will increase again uh, because this is by far and away the easiest way to try and deal with trouble uh, than um, for books to be balanced and uh, to have a massive depression. So I, I can only see um, similar type of increases uh, in future when the next crisis hits. Next slide, please. 
And of course, the, the starting point um, is just all the time getting you know, slightly more worrying uh, for these further increases in, in deficits and debt. Uh, if we look here at a chart of federal debt, which is the solid black line, and the bars, which is the federal budget deficit on the right-hand scale, um, you can see, and this is, by the way, the US Office of Management and Budgets uh, figures, the government's own figures, uh, you can see that even on the very optimistic views regarding the size of the budget deficit over the next few years, um, US federal debt held by the public, which has increased already to over 100% of GDP, is set to rise even further. Now, I would argue that the um, rate of increase of this debt and the size of the budget deficits will be quite a bit larger than shown on this chart. Uh, next slide, please. What that means, of course, also is that the US dollar, I think, will be under pressure in future because the US dollar's starting point is being, is, is that of a rather overvalued currency, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, and I think the most likely outcome for the US dollar over 22, 25 is that we're going to see a fairly substantial devaluation uh, on the DXY against the euro against the Japanese yen. Um, DXY is actually currently 94. It, the US dollar strengthened lately uh, a little bit since I made this chart. But I think the message is the same. Whilst we could well see further US dollar strength um, in the short term, and by the way, that will be negative for gold uh, due to the probability that there'll be some upward pressure on, on bond yields in the US, and US bond yields will look quite a bit higher, say, in the Eurozone or Japan. Um, the medium to long term picture is quite different uh, for the US dollar because US inflation will be substantially higher than in most other major economies. Uh, and I think the US will run particularly loose monetary and fiscal policy in, over the next few years. And of course, its debt levels uh, are higher um, in terms of its creditor position versus the rest of the world than the Eurozone, uh, which is a net creditor, and Japan, which is also a net creditor. And underpinning of this, of course, is the fact that I think, as I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, we are at an early stage in a decline, a multi-year decline in the US currency's international role and a move to a more multipolar um, monetary system, uh, international monetary system. So let's look at a couple more slides on the US dollar. Next slide, please, thank you. Um, so I mentioned the dollar being overvalued. Well, um, it's not just me saying it, it's the OECD uh, data, which I think is pretty crystal clear on this front. Um, we've got the purchasing power our parity data, um, the black dotted line here measured against the um, US dollar uh, end year exchange rate. These are both end year figures, by the way. Um, and you could see that in recent years, the US dollar has been really quite severely overvalued. And of course, uh, as, as you will know, the US dollar is currently at 116 against the euro, not 121 or 122 as shown on this chart. So that overvaluation has, has actually got worse and will get worse as US inflation is higher than in the eurozone, which means overvaluation will be more of an issue. And that, of course, is going to have an even worse effect on the trade account uh, and on the current account. Next slide, please. So talking of the trade deficit, this is now in record uh, levels of running at over $70 billion per month. And the trade deficit can really only be uh, addressed by one of two things or a combination of these two things, which is either or and or uh, a weaker US dollar, much the easiest path, right? Uh, or a major US economic recession or a combination of these two things. Um, clearly, my view is, is you know, that there's gonna be some kind of plaza accord uh, or a unilateral action by the US uh, or the market will just drive this because it starts to get edgy about uh, the US net international investment position as we'll see uh, and drives down the US dollar against uh, its currency rivals. Next slide, please. So talking of the US net international investment position, you could see a graph of this uh, from 1976 to the first quarter of 2021. And just to explain, the net international investment position measures the difference between the United States external financial assets and its financial liabilities for both the government and the private sector. Um, what's fueling this decline in the US net in international investment position into further and further uh, negativity um, 
is or are these huge budget and current account deficits that at the moment seem to have no end in sight. Um, and the only medicine that will cure this is, of course, once again, US dollar devaluation uh, or a massive hit to US demand uh, with the US uh, going through a period of austerity and paying back its creditors effectively. Uh, but by far and away, the easiest path, of course, is for the US dollar to devalue, which will, of course, raise the um, value of the US's foreign assets in US dollar terms uh, and do a lot to, to make this position better, because that will also may mean that the current account and the trade deficit will not be bleeding the way it is at the present time. Uh, and just before I leave this picture, um, I can share with you the fact that in the second quarter of 2021, uh, the data was just released the other day, um, this picture deteriorated by a further 1 trillion US dollars. So the net international investment position of the United States is now 15.4 trillion as of the end of the second quarter uh, of 2021, which is the equivalent of about 60% of US GDP. Uh, and I believe that this is completely unsustainable. It's not a picture that people are concentrating on at the moment, but I think they will in future, uh, and this will put major pressure on the US dollar. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So what does this actually mean for gold? Well, I think this combination uh, of factors that we've seen, inflation, um, real interest rates, inflation rising up, inflation uh, interest rates in real terms, uh, staying uh, in negative territory and probably getting more negative in time. Um, debt just becoming a worse and worse problem in an underlying sense, and at one point certainly becoming an actual major problem, I think. Uh, and the US dollar with, I think, a major US dollar devaluation on the cards is going to mean that gold has uh, a very fair wind um, behind its sales in the next few years. Now, that doesn't mean that over the next year or so, it, it couldn't be under some pretty considerable pressure. Uh, I think as tapering begets, becomes a bit more um, clear cut, uh, as the Fed starts to make some baby steps to, to uh, maybe raise interest rates and actually raise them a little bit, uh, I, th I think the gold price uh, could be under you know, some pressure. Um, but I think as a really pretty convinced um, with my message, uh, and that is that the Fed simply is not in a position to tighten monetary policy uh, meaningfully, and at the first sign of trouble, it's going to reverse course remarkably ra rapidly. And once that happens, I think the credibility of the Fed and generally of central banks will start to be really tested, and that will have a major impact on inflation expectations, of course, which itself will start to drive higher rates of inflation as people change their behavior to effectively uh, make that behavior fit with what I think is this new uh, inflationary rather than deflationary world. For gold, this is very good news. And I think that by 2025, for example, we could see gains from current price levels of over one third in the US dollar gold price. Well, uh, thanks very much for uh, listening to me, um, I'm sure you'll have some interesting questions. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Very insightful presentation. Let's go ahead and move to the next slide now. Philip's bullish outlook on gold price is a great segue into highlighting our project's significant leverage to rising gold prices, while also being resilient to lower gold prices given our solid position on the cost curve. Using our base $1,600 gold price, the project has an MPV of greater than $1.3 billion using a 5% discount rate, and it also delivers an internal rate of return of more than 22%. We have good leverage to higher gold prices as well, where the MPV is approximately $1.9 billion at 1850 gold. And based on Philip's long-term gold outlook, our MPV increases to nearly $3 billion at 2350 gold price. Based on our current market, market cap, we are trading at nearly the widest discount to NAV despite achieving major milestones over the last year. At current prices, our stock is trading at less than 20% of our net asset value. We believe this represents a very attractive entry price for new investors. 
Perpetua has achieved several major milestones beyond our recent strategic partnership with Ambry that Laurel touched on earlier. In the last year, our lead permitting agency published the draft environmental impact statement. We released our feasibility study and we were included in the Russell 2000 index after listing on the NASDAQ earlier this year. And in August, we raised gross proceeds of $57.5 million in a public offering, which was oversubscribed and further demonstrates the strength of our asset and our vision. We are now well capitalized to advance early restoration and field operations and continue through the permitting process. Looking forward, we have some exciting milestones around the corner. We expect the focused supplemental environmental impact statement on our proposed action to be published in the first quarter of next year with a final record of decision in the first half of 2023. And despite all of our recent achievements and near-term catalysts, we continue to be significantly undervalued relative to our peer group with nearly all of the pre-permitted projects trading at a multiple of two to four times where we are trading and some fully permitted gold developers trade at premiums to their net asset values. We expect a significant re-rating to occur as we advance through the permitting process, but also believe there is opportunity now as we share our investment thesis with a broader investor group who recognize the strategic value of our asset for its antimony, as well as thematic investors looking for companies whose ESG principles are foundational to their business plans. We also believe there's further valuation upside given our focus on not just responsible development, but on our commitment to environmental restoration together with our direct link to enabling decarbonization efforts. Wrapping up, Perpetual Resources is unique because we bring solutions. We have a large, low cost and high grade open pit gold mine. We will offer the only domestic mine source of the critical mineral ant money which will play a key role in leading efforts to decarbonize power grids all over the world. And we will use mine development to fund restoration at an abandoned mine site. Not only is our opportunity unique, but it's also the right time. Our company is trading at less than 20% of our project's value at 1850 gold prices. And we have so many exciting milestones and catalysts just around the corner after a decade of engineering work stakeholder feedback, and regulatory review. As we continue to hit our permitting milestones, we expect our valuation to significantly improve, creating value for our long-term shareholders. So with that, I'll hand back to Mackenzie for the Q&A session. Thank you, Jess. And before we jump into the Q&A session, I want to remind everyone that uh, you're free and welcome to submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Our first question, it looks like, is for Philip. Philip, how volatile do you expect gold to be in the near term? Um, I think gold could be quite volatile looking over the near term because the market is pretty bewitched by what the Fed is going to do and the timing of what it's going to do uh, over the next, say, year and a half. I think, therefore, as market expectations change regarding the pace of tapering, the timing of tapering, the extent of any interest rate rises, I think that could have a effect on the price that, that is certainly leading to significant volatility and probably a bias to the downside um, until such time that the sort of bluff in a sense of the Fed is called. And I think at that point, uh, gold prices will uh, preemptively start to, to, to show that, that the market um, no longer believes. Um, but that all probably translates into quite a bit of um, up and down movement for the gold price over the next 12 to 18 months, I think, um, as opposed to the sort of strong trend upwards that I think is more likely to be with us in the medium to long term. Excellent, thank you. And the next question is for you as well. How do you recommend gaining leverage to gold? Do you recommend buying physical gold or gold stocks or gold FTEs? Well, I, I think it's probably best to have a, a sort of basket approach. And 
invest maybe in some physical gold. Uh, obviously, there are storage issues there in, in terms of safety at home, even if you have an ice safe uh, or um, putting it into a safety deposit box. Uh, but I think for most people, it's, it's a question of ETFs and stocks. Um, I think the ETF is a, is a great way to get exposure to gold. And I think stocks obviously give you much greater leverage than gold if you believe there's going to be a bull market in, in gold. Uh, stocks will massively outperform gold. And they'll actually massively outperform gold in the medium to long term, even if the stock market takes a bath and underperforms. Uh, initially, if, if you get a major pop in the stock market, downward pop, I mean, uh, pop of the bubble, uh, I, I think obviously that sort of tide going down is, is, is going to bring all boats down, including even stocks that have intrinsic value and good upside in future. But eventually the, the gold stocks will react very powerfully to the prop prospect and actuality of higher gold prices, and they will perform really well. Um, I was having a conversation the other day with Jessica regarding home state mining uh, in the 1970s. And I, I haven't got the data with me now, but I'm sure some people have access to, to that stock's uh, price movements in the 1970s. Um, and I'm pretty sure that notwithstanding the fact that the um, stock market was in the doldrums during that decade, home state did great, great stuff uh, because of the rising gold price. And it'll be the same this time round. These gold stocks will do extremely well if my forecasts are half correct. Thank you, Philip. And just I think that leads into another good question for you, which is what is the percent of the Stibnite gold project or what percent of the Stibnite gold project is gold versus antimony? Yeah, so gold accounts for approximately 95% of our project's overall revenue using our base gold price of $1,600 and our base antimony price of $350 per pound. So while gold is certainly the main driver of our project economics, antimony is also a very strategic and valuable byproduct given it provides a credit to our cost of $70 per ounce using our conservative pricing. So I think... Um, Tying into Philip's previous point about owning gold stocks, the beauty of having that strategic um, byproduct is it also helps keep you know, a lower cost in downturns, but we've got that significant leverage given 95% of our revenue is gold. Thank you. Let's see here. Just a reminder, if you wanna submit a question, please do through our QA box at the bottom of your screen. The next one we have, Philip, goes back to you. What does the forecast of gold supply look like in coming years? Does that also yeah. play a role into your bullish forecast? Um, it, it does at the margin. Um, if we sort of go back to the um, last rally in gold prices, and, and I don't know, take 2008 to 2012, um, gold mine production increased then by about 560 tons, about 23% between 2008, 2012. Um, we also had at that time a huge increase in recycling of jewelry. Uh, quite extraordinary cash for gold activity in developed markets like the US in particular, but, but also in certain European countries um, with people trading in their old jewelry. Now, I think this time around, it's gonna be somewhat different. Firstly, I think mine production is not gonna grow anything like as quickly because there isn't the pipeline that there was in the mid 2000s late uh, to, to sort of come on stream relatively quickly that 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 sort of doesn't exist now um, and therefore I think any increase in mine production say between 21 and 25 is going to be more of the order of 10 percent at most so we're looking at something more like less than 300 tons metric as opposed to 560. And more importantly, still perhaps, is I think that the recycling of jewelry will not be nearly uh, as strong a contributor to supply as it was back uh, 2008 through to 2012. And the reason for thinking that is what we've really seen in the last two to three years, which is quite modest levels of scrap recycling given the lift in prices that we've seen and it would the explanation for this would would appear to be that 
the increase in prices back uh, a decade or more ago was, was so great compared to where prices had been that this really led to a huge clear out of both consumer jewelry stocks, but also stocks that were uh, held by the trade. And, and the trade and to some extent, the consumers are much leaner now. Uh, there's much less available, very near market jewelry stock than there was uh, back then. So I think we're going to see, yes, some increase in supply, which will modestly uh, offset the huge growth in investment demand that I expect in future years. Uh, and perhaps some lift in central bank buying, but it won't be the, the kind of counter current that we saw um, over a decade ago, not, not the same size. Thank you, Philip. Um, we have one more question I think we've got time for to squeeze in here, which is, do you think that cryptocurrency is impacting the current gold price or will impact it in the future? Uh, yes, I, I think crypto at the margin uh, has had a negative effect. Um, I, I don't think it's huge, but I think clearly at the margin, there's been some, uh, shall we say, interest on the part of younger, if I can you know, make a generalization, uh, more speculative investors uh, in crypto uh, than in gold. And I think that's probably been more of um, an issue for the silver market uh, than for the gold market. I think in terms of gold, the, the kind of money that one would expect to come into gold if, if we see um, an increase in inflation expectations and people looking for a hedge against uh, other mainstream asset classes uh, is, if I may call it so, more serious money, uh, money that's probably quite turned off by the lack of depth of the crypto market and its huge volatility. Uh, and they will see gold as a far more attractive alternative because gold is a is a rather deep uh, um, market that you could trade. And yeah, we talked about volatility increasing um, a moment ago, but bear in mind that gold trades in terms of volatility far more like a currency than a commodity. Uh, and that's very attractive to um, those who are not of such a, shall we say, purely speculative bent, but are looking for uh, you know, a hedge asset or something that they wanna invest in as an alternative to bonds and stocks. Well, thank you, Philip. And I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who attended today's webinar. We appreciate your interest uh, in the Sydney Gold Project and joining us to, to learn more from Philip today. Another reminder to watch this webinar later on. We will have it posted along with many other webinars that we've hosted on our website on the webinars page, which is at perpetuaresources.com backslash webinars. Please join us again in the future and thank you very much.